Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Renew Adelaide Branch's February meeting. This is the meeting that we should have had in on, in November, but circumstances overtook us. My name is Alan Strickland. I'm the Adelaide Branch convener, and I acknowledge the traditional cust custodians of the lands on which we meet. Um, before the presentation tonight, I must um, mentioned that the November newsletter advised that the election of Adelaide branch office bearers for 2002-21 would be held at the February meeting and I invited nominate, we invited nominations. The 2020 committee are all happy to re-nominate and I thank them for their contributions over the, the past year and I also thank Sean Zeppel for his work in recording the in-person meetings. But as uh, no other nominations have been received, I declare that the office bearers for 2021 are as follows. Convening Treasurer, myself, Alan Strickland. The committee is Catherine Hamilton, Maxine Jones, Catherine MacDonald, Gail Fogarty and John Zeppel. So congratulations to all, uh, but I encourage all members to take an interest in branch meetings and especially come up with ideas for presentations and future site visits. Now, the theme of tonight's presentation is resilient electricity grids. And our presenter is uh, Dr. Bryn Williams, who's the future energy strategy manager of South Australian Power Networks. He'll explain what makes a resilient grid and how the company maintains quality and continuity while optimizing renewable energy content. He'll describe the SAPN blueprint for transforming the network and services to meet future needs. And if you have any questions, please send them via the Q&A button and I'll read them out at the end of the presentation. So I now hand over to Dr. Bryn Williams. Thanks, Alan. Let me just share my screen. So perhaps can I just confirm that you can hear me okay and you can see the slides? Yes, can hear and uh, see it. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Alan. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to Alan and Renew for the opportunity to present to you this evening. So I thought I'd begin just by quickly recapping who SLA Power Networks is and, and what we do. Um, not, not everyone's clear on this. So since about 20 years ago, the electricity sector has been broken up into these four components. Um, on the left, we have uh, large generators, gas-fired power stations, uh, solar and wind farms. These are privately held companies. Uh, we have the transmission network. This is the very high voltage backbone of the grid. In South Australia, this is a company called Electronet. And then we have SA Power Network. So we look after the distribution network. So uh, the poles and wires, all the infrastructure between, uh, well, including substations, stubby poles, wires, street transformers, everything from the substation down to the premises. Um, and then you have the retailers, AGL, Origin Energy and others. Um, and the retailer's job is to purchase energy from the generators on the spot market, purchase network services from ourselves um, and package those up into retail products. So the, the customers bill. So we, as FC Power Networks, we have a specific role to play in the industry. We don't generate electricity and we don't sell electricity. In fact, we're actually prevented by regulation from doing those things, even if we wanted to. We're a private company. We're not government owned, but we are fully regulated by the Australian Energy Regulator. Um, and that means that our annual revenues are set every year, or they're set five, year, five years at a time by the AER. Um, in the context of renewables, that means, for example, that we don't lose money if people put in a lot of solar PV and consume less from the grid, and nor do we make more money if people go and buy a lot of electric vehicles and consume more from the grid. So our revenues are fixed, um, and we recover those revenues through network tariffs, which are paid by retailers and then passed through in the retail bill. And our component of the bill accounts for about 26% of the typical customer bill in South Australia. 
says us. I thought by way of context for tonight's presentation, I might start with this slide. This is um, a chart from 2018, but it shows that Australia is leading the world in the transition to distributed energy. So this shows the decentralized, the decentralization ratio of different power systems in the world. So while countries like Germany, for example, have got lots of renewables in their power system, um, they tend to be biased towards large scale wind and solar farms. Australia is quite unique in having a very high proportion of our energy system um, supplied by small scale distributed energy resources, so rooftop solar. That's Australia, South Australia is at the front end of that transition nationally. So while, for example, Queensland has got roughly the same percentage of customers with rooftop solar as we do here in South Australia, uh, Queensland has a much bigger energy system and much more underlying loads. So uh, as a proportion of the total energy system, rooftop PV in South Australia is a long way ahead. Uh, the chart, the orange bars on the chart show how rooftop PV has grown in South Australia since 2010. Uh, to about the middle of last year when we hit uh, about 1.5 gigawatts of installed capacity. As you can see on the picture, that's roughly equivalent to the average demand for the state. Now, the orange line is AMO's forward-looking forecasts as the market operator. Um, and so we think that this is likely to double within about the next five to seven years. Uh, also, a leader in the uptake of home batteries, uh, helped along by things like the SA government's home battery scheme, and in particular, the use of those in virtual power plants. So we've got, I think at last count, nine different um, organizations offering VPP schemes in South Australia at the moment. That's more than anywhere else in Australia. And these are beginning to actively participate in the energy market. So this is small customers' batteries being aggregated together by someone like AGL or Simply Energy or Tesla. Um, and dispatched and operated in unison as if they were um, a large power plant. Most of you on this call will probably be aware um, that in October last year, we reached this threshold event in South Australia where for a period in the middle of the day on the 11th of October, the entire state of South Australia was powered by solar PV. Uh, so this hasn't happened before. And the chart there shows the load profile throughout the day with the pale yellow section in the middle showing the amount of energy that was being supplied by small scale rooftop PV. So the market doesn't see this, this is behind the meter. What the market sees is the black line um, and the dark yellow area there in the middle of the day um, is large solar farms making up the difference. The blue area is gas generation. AEMO, the market operator, has to keep a certain amount of old school spinning generation running at all times to keep the system stable. And so you can see during the middle of the day on the 11th of October, um, AMO is running the minimum amount of gas generation and all of that energy is being exported over the interconnector uh, interstate. So at this time, our distribution network um, was essentially at zero. So the net load on our network got as low as 21 megawatts. Recall the typical load is about 1500 megawatts. Um, about more than 50% of our substations were running backwards at this time. So large parts of South Australian grid were running in reverse. Um, and as it says on the right there, there's, there's really no other energy system in the world that has ever been operated at this level of distributed renewables. So we really are right at the front end. So what does that mean for us as a distribution network? Um, apologies, you're gonna see this stuck curve sort of picture a lot tonight. Um, but just to recap, it shows in this case, kind of a typical residential area load profile on a hot summer's day in South Australia as it stands today. So you can see on the left hand side, a bit of energy use overnight around midnight once everyone's um, hot water service is running overnight, drops down in the early hours of the morning, slight peak, uh, in the mornings, everyone gets up and then solar kicks in. So we have this, this period in the middle of the day where energy is being exported to the grid. Um, in this case, uh, hot summer's day. So late afternoon, sun starts to go down, load really picks up through air conditioning and we reach this, this evening peak. Um, and that's that late summer afternoon or early evening air conditioning peak is what the distribution network is built to supply. That's, that's what the network has been sized for to make sure we can supply that load. 
uh, on very hot summer's days. Um, the network also, of course, has a certain capacity to take energy in the other direction, and that's what I've shown at the bottom there. So, so that's picture is intended to illustrate, if you like, the size of the pipe that we we manage, and we often refer to that as the as the technical operating envelope of the network. So, as we continue to connect more and more distributed solar in South Australia, like other distribution networks, we approve new systems that are five kilowatts or smaller. Um, to connect to the network. But what we know from some modeling that we did a couple of years ago where we looked at, well, what would, uh, what would it be like if every customer had solar PV? We know that the actual capacity of our network as it stands today is probably more like one to two kilowatts of export per customer. So as we continue connecting more five kilowatt systems, we are starting to reach the point now across many areas of our network where we're starting to bump up against this technical limit of how much energy the network can take in. And what that means is that at certain times, not all the time, in fact, only quite rarely, but on very sunny days, usually in springtime when the weather is mild and there's very little underlying air conditioning load or other loads, um, customers in these areas that have a lot of solar start to experience um, over voltage issues, their inverters trip off and so on, this is well known. Um, beyond the voltage issue, we're actually starting to approach the what we call the thermal limits, the current current carrying limits of some of our, some of our assets as well at these times. So that's the challenge we face in continuing to connect more solar. As we move into the future, of course, we also have new loads coming on the horizon, so electric vehicles um, and the operation of virtual power plants. We can have very many batteries all charging simultaneously. For simultaneously from the grid in response to some market price event. Um, if these loads come online um, in summertime in the afternoon, then we could see a new growth in peak demand. And that means that um, as a network, we'll need new investment to upgrade the size of the assets. And of course that tends to put up with pressure on prices. So what are we doing about all this? I'll talk quickly through a number of things that we're doing right now, and then I'll talk to a few of them in a little more detail. So one thing that we did um, in July last year, we launched what we call our solar sponge time of use tariff. So this is a new kind of network tariff. Um, it's time of use has a very low off peak rate in the middle of the day. It's not something that we or any other network has done before. Um, but the benefit of this tariff is that it gives customers, um, particular customers who don't have solar, um, the opportunity to save money if they can move some of their loads into the middle of the day. So um, dishwasher, washing machine, those sorts of things. And that's good because it helps to soak up the surplus solar. We're actively looking at the opportunity of moving some of the overnight hot water load into the middle of the day as well. Um, and there's a trial uh, that will run in South Australia this year with Ream and Solar Heart um, to test the use of smart hot water systems that we're actively involved in. We're doing a number of things um, to tackle local voltage issues on the network. Um, it, back in 2017, we brought our connection standards, our technical standards for inverters up to match industry best practice, um, requiring that all new inverters have this, what we call this volt var response mode activated in them. It's really just a technical way for the inverter to um, inject the most energy with the least impact on local voltage. Um, we're also, running a $10 million program at the moment to upgrade um, about 140 of our substations to improve voltage regulation. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And finally, kind of our flagship um, technical approach to enabling our grid to accommodate more and more rooftop solar is what we call flexible export limits or flexible exports, um, also called dynamic operating envelopes a lot in the industry at the moment. Um, and so this is investing in the systems that we need um, to enable the next generation of smart internet connected inverters to talk to us, to interrogate the distribution network, to find out dynamically what the local network capacity is like in their area at any given time. And then they can adjust themselves accordingly. And I'll talk a bit more about that as well. So, We'll start with voltage. 
our obligation, our regulation is to maintain voltage at the customer's connection point um, to Australian standards, which means keeping the voltage between 216 and 253 volts. So the nominal voltage is 230, but there's a range either side of that that's allowed. Voltage is controlled essentially back at the substation. That's really the only point at which we have control over voltage in our network. And so traditionally when the network was constructed um, back in the days before solar, um, the network is built and designed so that voltage tends to sit up at the upper end of that range at times of minimum demand. That's kind of how you want to design a network um, that's only supplying energy one way because voltage um, only ever drops from the substation along the length of the line. And the more load there is on the system, the more that voltage drops. So if we're going to have the maximum capacity to, to accommodate high demand in summertime, then when the network is very idle, so overnight, for example, we want to design it so the voltage sits, sits near the top end and that gives us the most leg room for voltage to drop down before we have to spend money upgrading stuff. Of course, with the advent of solar, um, we now have voltage being driven up at the customer end of the line um, and we have very little headroom because of the way that network has been designed to accommodate that, that rise in voltage. So what the chart is showing is that this is a, a histogram of the spread of voltage across a number of customers in an area of our network that has a lot of solar PV um, on a mild sunny day in 2019 in the middle of the day and you can see that the voltage is skewed way up to, to, to the top of that allowed range. In fact, a lot of these customers inverters will probably be uh, self containing or ramping down at this time. And you can see that we've actually got some customers that are that are outside the 253 volts. So we have an, an over voltage issue in this area. So the question is, well, can we not just lower the voltage there now? So we have a network that was designed before solar. Now we have solar on the network. Can we not just adjust the the voltage across the network to drop it down a bit. To answer that, we can look at something like this. This is the same set of customers that we looked at previously, but this is a couple of months later um, at eight o'clock in the evening on a very hot summer's day. So very little solar at this time of the evening, lots and lots of air conditioning load. And you can see that all of that load has pulled the voltage down in this area, way down to the bottom end of the range. Um, and in fact, as you can probably see, if you look closely, we've actually got quite a large number of customers in this area that are experiencing under voltage where they're not, they're not being supplied even to the minimum 216. So what this tells us is that the, it's not as simple as just, quotes, lowering the volts. The issue we have is one of a much greater dynamic range that we have to manage um, than the network was designed for. And so the way we need to address that is we need to upgrade our voltage management equipment in our substations to be able to change that voltage level more dynamically according to how much load there is at the time. Um, that's called line drop compensation and that's what we've been rolling out over about 140 of our substations since uh, late last year. So a quick update on what that looks like. This is kind of where we're up to as of um, early February when this program is finished, um, which will be in the next couple of months, we will have reached about 84% uh, of customers. Um, we're currently sitting at about 56% um, and we're busy rolling, it, rolling out this capability to the remaining substations in that set of 140. Um, apologies for all the technical charts, but I thought some of you might be interested to see kind of what that looks like. This is um, a year's worth of load curve for one of our Adelaide Hills substations. So what the purple shows is the spread of load at this substation on every day of the year back to February 2019. So you can see, for example, um, that load kind of averages about one and a half to two megawatts at this substation, tends to be higher through the winter months. Um, other than these occasional very, very high spikes um, in the summer where we have heat waves and we have very, very hot days. And as we said at the beginning, these, this is really what the network is built for. Um, you can also see this substation is in reverse flow most of the time during the sunnier months of the year. Um, and so this is an area where we, 
have very high penetration of solar PV and it's an area where we definitely knew that we had some voltage issues. Um, we've now activated this or installed and commissioned this line drop compensation, this voltage regulation function at the substation. And it's a bit hard to see on this chart, but if you look down the bottom right corner, I've tried to illustrate it. So the effect of that has been that um, where previously on these very mild sunny days when we have the maximum reverse flows through this substation, um, voltage has been sitting right up at the top end. So a lot of those inverters would have been not operating to their full export performance because they're self curtailing due to high voltage. Um, now we've been able to significantly improve voltage at this substation during these times by dynamically adjusting it. Um, we've actually liberated about an extra 500 kilowatts of generation through the system from those small customer systems um, as a result. So we're kind of very pleased with this program. It's a very effective uh, intervention. It's even though we only kicked this off in the second half of last year, we've already seen a noticeable uh, reduction in the number of customers calling in with high voltage issues in, in high solar areas through the spring season. So um, so this, this program will continue to roll out for the, for the next couple of months um, and it should, at least for the next couple of years, it should have a material benefit in increasing the amount of solar we can accommodate before we start hitting voltage issues on the network. Um, we can do more advanced things or we could do if we had the data, something that the Victorian networks have, who have the benefit of 100% smart meter coverage in Victoria have been doing is putting in place even smarter voltage regulation at the substation, which actually um, can see, if you like, all the way down the line, it can, it can actually operate on data directly from the customer endpoint. Um, so we've been running a trial, it's, we call this closed loop voltage controls, this is a more advanced capability um, that we will look to roll out in South Australia in future, um, as and when we, we reach the penetration of smart meters and we have the access to the information we need to, to implement this kind of solution. Um, all that said, we know as we continue to connect more and more solar onto the system, um, we know at some point we will reach the technical limits of the network in certain areas. And when that happens, we are faced with a choice as to what we do about it. So there's kind of three things that we can do. The first thing is we can invest in upgrading the network in those areas. So replacing transformers, build, putting in bigger wires, etc. cetera. Um, which certainly solves the problem by adding more export capacity, but of course it does drive cost onto customers ultimately. At the other end of the spectrum, um, we can simply um, stop accepting new connections for solar systems once a particular part of the air of the network is saturated or in fact we would continue to allow connections but we might impose conditions of connection to say that if you're connecting a new system in this area it has to be configured um, with a zero export limit or a very low export limit um, now we're not doing this today in south australia but it is something that's starting to happen in networks in other states um, so in victoria for example there are many thousands of customers today um, who are connecting solar in areas um, that already have very high penetration that are being put onto these sort of arrangements. Um, this has the benefit that it doesn't drive up costs um, for other customers by requiring new investment in the network, but of course it's not a great outcome for new solar customers connecting. Um, finally, and of course, this is the solution that we prefer. We can just be smarter about using the capacity that we've got. We know that um, the sorts of issues we're talking about really only arise very rarely. It's a small number of days a year. It's, a, it's rather like the summer afternoon peak. It's a small number of days a year um, for a small number of hours a day. The rest of the time, the network has sufficient capacity to, to, to have energy exported through it. So this kind of the centerpiece of our technical strategy going forward and we've been leading um, in this regard um, across the industry is to try to move or to uh, put in place the systems that we need to enable 
what we call flexible export limits, as I said at the beginning. So smart inverters that instead of having a fixed export limit can have a variable export limit. And just a couple more uh, load profiles just to illustrate what that looks like in practice. So this is intended to show the load profile for a, a typical residential customer um, who maybe have a five kilowatt solar PV system they're exporting to the network in the middle of the day. The red dotted line at the bottom shows our current five kilowatt export limit that we apply for all um, small scale solar systems, or single phase. And at the top, you can see the, you know, what might be the actual true hosting capacity of this part of the network if every customer had solar. And so as, as that part of the network starts to fill up, um, we could reduce our export limit to a level that we think is actually sustainable to keep connecting customers. So in this case, 1.5 kilowatts. Um, and that helps to manage the voltage issue. But it means that, of course, solar customers, although they can still connect solar and they can still get the benefit of using their solar in-house, they're limited to only being able to export up to 1.5 kilowatts. So a lot of the energy produced from their system in the summer um, essentially is lost. They can't use that, they can't export it to the network. On the other hand, even in a constrained area, so an area with lots and lots of solar PV, and even at a constrained time, mild sunny day in spring, if we can provide that customer a flexible export limit, if they've got a smart inverter that can talk to us over the internet and download its export limit dynamically through the day, then it might look something like this. Um, we can allow that, ex that customer to export right up to the actual true capacity of their network. So we make the best possible use of the network assets that we've got. And that customer, um, their system may only need to reduce its exports uh, through the very middle of the day. Unlike a fixed export limit, which is set and forget at the time of install, so it applies all year round, um, with a flexible limit, of course, at other times when the network isn't constrained, that customer can export to their full capacity, or in this example, potentially up to 10 kilowatts. So here's an example of the same customer on a, uh, a hot summer day when there's lots of underlying load at these times, um, we have more capacity to take solar into the network. In fact, it's a good thing if customers' energy is going to the network at those times, of course. And so with a flexible limit, we can open up that capacity and, and those systems can operate to their full capacity at those times. So we did a bunch of economic and technical modeling around this concept a couple of years ago. Um, it's it's kind of the way of the future. It's something that's being pursued in other jurisdictions as well. Um, California, for example. And we've been actively working to build this capability and trial it um, for the last couple of years. So in July 2019, we were fortunate enough to get some funding from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency to run a trial in South Australia um, with Tesla and their virtual power plant. So they have a uh, a virtual power plant with a thousand customers. Um, and we partnered with Tesla and built the systems to um, test this capability with the VPP. And that has been running in the field ever since. And through this trial, we've been able to demonstrate that for these customers um, who have five kilowatts of solar and a five kilowatt battery on site, um, we're able to raise our export limit from our standard five kilowatts um, up to 10 kilowatts the majority of the time um, because we know that we can reduce it back down again if we need to at those times when the network is under stress. Um, and that's a good thing for the virtual power plant because it means that they can do things that they couldn't otherwise do. They can discharge their batteries um, at times even when the solar is producing. So it gives the, the VPP greater opportunity to participate in the market uh, and that's beneficial for everyone. So it's been a successful trial. Um, and as we move forward, of course, we're working to take these concepts from trials through to production. Um, and so in our last uh, proposal to the Australian Energy Regulator, which was lodged in June, or it was, it was approved in June last year, um, 
we proposed a $32 million program of investment to build the, the real production systems that we need to build this capability across our whole network. And so as our um, VPP trial with Tesla draws to an end, um, we've again been fortunate enough to secure some additional funding from Arena for a second stage trial. Um, and we're working with leading solar um, inverter manufacturers, Fronius and SMA and Solar Edge, um, a technology company switched in, and another Australian network, Victorian network, Osnet Services, to run a field trial of this capability um, in, not in batteries, but in regular solar inverters um, over the next, or over a 12 month period commencing from the middle of this year. At the end of that trial, our intention is to have brought that capability to the level that we can then start to open that up as a standard connection offer for new customers connecting solar. So customers who can bring a smart inverter and want to take advantage of this service can access um, this flexible export limit and much greater access to available network capacity. So this is kind of super exciting for us. This is um, industry leading. South Australia really is at the front end. Um, there are a couple of other trials in other states that are looking to do similar things. Um, but we've, and we're doing a lot of work with the whole industry um, to co-design um, industry-wide, Australia-wide technical standards to support this capability. Um, incidentally, although I said that this is something that's being done in other jurisdictions, um, we actually find ourselves somewhere in front even of places like California that have been leaders in developing these standards originally. So I'll just shift gears briefly and talk a little bit about system security. So I've talked a lot about um, the challenges that we face as a distribution network um, in integrating lots of distributed energy into, it, into the system and some of the things we're doing about those. Um, as I think most people on this call would know, very high levels of solar PV, as we said at the beginning, um, pose challenges for AEMO at a system level as well. Um, AEMO's responsibility is to keep the system stable. Um, and as we said earlier, with very, very high levels of solar, it becomes difficult for AEMO to keep enough spinning generation online to keep the system stable. And we become increasingly reliant on um, our interconnector to export that surplus energy into state at times um, when we've got very high solar and very little demand. So at these times, the system can be at risk if we have a technical fault in the interconnector, for example, at the wrong time, um, then we face the risk that the system could become unstable and we could have another statewide blackout in South Australia. So while system security is AEMO's responsibility, that's not our responsibility as a distribution network, um, we do have a role in supporting AEMO um, in helping to manage this issue. And we're working very actively with AEMO and with the state government um, to do the things that we can to, to help to manage the system security risk in South Australia. So just a couple of examples of that. Um, we have always operated a scheme that we call under frequency load shedding for AEMO. Um, this is an emergency scheme that operates in our substations if we have a sudden imbalance of supply and demand. So if, for example, a, a large generator were to blow up and we have suddenly much too much load on the system and not enough generation, um, then our substations will detect that condition and they will automatically trip off um, whole high voltage feeders. So thousands of customers at a time um, in a, a, an automated emergency response to try to restore um, the balance and keep the system or get the system back into a stable condition. Um, in today's world, of course, we have times when um, large parts of our network are running in reverse. And the last thing we want to do if there's too much load and not enough generation is to trip off um, a few thousand customers who are actually um, feeding generation into the system. So, so we've had to, we, we have to do some work to upgrade the equipment that provides this capability to, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, we're also looking at 
what we're calling uh, enhanced voltage management. So the sorts of capabilities we talked about earlier, the, the, um, the line drop compensation, the substation voltage control work that we've done also gives us some new capabilities we didn't have before, um, including the capability if we are directed to do so, and if it's um, if there is a system emergency, like a failure of the interconnector at a time when we have very, very large amounts of um, solar on the system, we can potentially push um, system voltage up at certain substations, which has the effect of causing solar inverters to ramp down. So this is something that we do already when we're directed to by AMO for large solar farms, we, we already will direct them to ramp down if, if AMO directs us to. Um, and this is a capability that we can potentially um, apply to smaller scale systems as well. Um, and you may be aware that the South Australian government last year uh, in September moved to put in place a bunch of um, SA specific regulations um, to try to mitigate some of these system security issues, including new requirements on um, solar systems installed in the state to require them all, uh, to, to require that all new systems have some capability to be remotely disconnected. Um, if AMO as a system operator or the state government um, directs that that needs to happen because there is some system emergency going on. Um, and I won't talk much about this other than to say that we've been working very actively with the solar industry um, and the state government and AEMO um, to do what we can as a distribution network to, to help, basically to help the industry to, to comply with these new requirements. So talked a lot about generation. I just want to talk a little bit before we finish um, and go to questions, talk a little bit about the other side of the ledger, which is um, the load side. Obviously the big thing on the horizon is the transition to electric vehicles. Um, this chart shows AEMO's most recent forecast of EV uptake for South Australia. Um, there are any number of these forecasts. Some of them are much more aggressive than this. Um, but generally we expect that the market will continue to be relatively slow for the next couple of years. And then at some point, um, as we begin to reach price parity, um, we expect the transition to occur actually quite quickly. So we need to be ready for that as an energy system. So kind of why do we care? It's just some illustrations. Um, an average household that takes on an electric vehicle will probably add about 40% to their total energy consumption. So that's a lot more energy being supplied through our network. But we also know that electric vehicle charges are significant load. So even the smaller units that you would have at home um, would be comparable to the biggest loads that people have in their houses today. So a small EV charger comparable to um, an air conditioner or a hot water system. So significant numbers of customers take on electric vehicle charges. That's a very significant increase in the average uh, load for a, for a house. When we talk about public charging stations, obviously up to sizes like 350 kilowatts for some of the large um, commercial charging networks that are being rolled out now, that's, that's kind of equivalent to a small subdivision or residential area. So there's very, very big loads. For what we know, um, as we've kind of consistent with what we've been discussing up until now, is that the network has got actually a lot of capacity in it. It's built to supply that late afternoon, summer heat wave day, one day a year, that extreme spike in demand. And so the rest of the time, it's got a lot of capacity to supply load. And so, so long as we can ensure that electric vehicles um, are generally charged outside of the summer peak demand times, then we can accommodate an awful lot of EVs without having to upgrade the distribution network. Um, and CSIRO did some modeling on this uh, a few years ago, and they calculated that um, the impact of the transition to electric vehicles um, on electricity prices could be um, around a 13% reduction in per unit cost of energy. And that's because um, if the distribution network costs um, aren't going up, so if we can accommodate this charging 
within the capacity that we have, then we're amortizing the fixed cost of the network across a, a larger volume of energy delivered. So the per unit cost goes down. Conversely, of course, if everyone comes home from work and plugs in their EV and all start charging at the same time at six or seven o'clock in the evening on a summer's day, um, then we will definitely need to invest in upgrading the network to add more capacity. Um, and again, when Syro modeled that scenario, um, what they call the uncontrolled charging scenario, they found that that 13% benefit opportunity was essentially eroded. So, so electricity price uh, would stay broadly the same per unit. So you'd lose that opportunity um, that, that otherwise would arise. So I'll talk quickly about the things that we're doing around EVs. Um, obviously it's early days of the market, so we're, we're doing a few early things. We've been thinking about uh, our tariffs to, to make sure that they are as EV friendly as they can be. So a few years ago, we changed our tariff, uh, sorry, our connection rules to allow uh, customers with EVs to put their EV charges at home on overnight controlled load. So that gives access to a, um, a very low off peak rate overnight, keeps that charging load out of that afternoon peak. Um, and of course, more recently, those residential time of use solar sponge tariffs that I talked about at the beginning, very well suited to electric vehicle charging, gives, uh, they give EV customers a lot of opportunity to access very low prices if they can uh, keep their charging out of peak times. Um, we've also been looking at our large tariffs. These are the tariffs that are paid by um, large commercial customers. Um, and they're the tariffs that would apply to large commercial electric vehicle charging sites, um, the big uh, highway charging stations. And those kind of customers, those large customers pay tariffs that are based on their peak demand, not their amount of energy consumed. Um, and so for something really big, like a big electric vehicle charger, that gets pretty expensive. Um, and so in that area, we've basically revisited the way we calculate that peak demand um, to average it over a longer period. And this means that particularly in the early stages of the market where large charging stations may have occasional very high peaks in demand, but generally may not consume a lot of energy, um, it will significantly reduce their network costs. Um, We've been doing some work to bring electric vehicles in our, into our own fleet. And this is certainly something we'll probably be ramping up more in the next couple of years. Um, any of you who have seen the South Australian government, I'm sure many of you have seen, this, seen the SA government uh, electric vehicle action plan that talks a lot about the opportunity of, of uh, large vehicle fleets to lead the way. Um, obviously vehicles coming into fleets flow down to the second hand market over time. So that helps to bootstrap the market. Um, a few years ago, we bought 12 Mitsubishi Outlander hybrids um, and we set up a charging area at our head office in Keswick um, and we've been operating those vehicles as a pool um, for employees so they're on the road every day for staff who who are working out of the Keswick office and need to travel around the state. Um, we're looking at the next generation vehicles obviously to bring into our business um, such as the, the Hyundai Kona that you can see in the picture on the left there. Um, we're also looking to support people who are looking to put in public charging infrastructure. And again, the SA action plan, um, we'll see a lot of work happening in that area over the next couple of years as the, the $13 million of, of government uh, grant funding flows out. Um, we're, we're not in the business of operating our own electric vehicle charging network. That's not our role as a regulated distribution network, but we can certainly help others who are. Um, this particular project, we partnered with um, SA Government, um, City of Adelaide, Tesla, Mitsubishi um, to build this, uh, this electric vehicle charging hub in Franklin Street, which many of you would have seen. So that's a project that we actively partnered in, um, in part because access to, to the, some of the charging data from some of these charging stations helps inform us a little bit about what we might expect into the future as, as other commercial charging networks roll out. Um, uh, the one on the bottom right there, this is uh, um, a station that's gone in in uh, Largs Bay, I think it is. This is a local council that was undertaking some um, undergrounding work. So taking some of our overhead um, infrastructure and putting the wires underground. Um, 
and we've been looking for opportunities or offering um, councils who are doing those kinds of works opportunities to to put in electric vehicle charging stations at the same time if, if that's something they want to do because it obviously it makes sense to do that while you're doing those other works um, and finally we look we're actively seeking opportunities to the extent we can um, to help to advocate for and promote the uptake of electric vehicles and this is just one example of that this was a, a program that ran in south australia i think two years ago um, led by a company called Evenergy. it was a social media campaign they organized a, a drive day in adelaide the AV, AVA people who were on the call um, were obviously involved in that as well um, and so we were sponsors of that program and we'll we'll seek other opportunities where we can to do similar things so that's been a lot of talking from me it's tried to cover a lot of ground um, through the presentation so i'll just briefly summarize and then we can have a look at uh, some of the questions i see there are some questions have been lodged so in summary um, the transition from central generation to distributed energy is increasing the community value of the distribution network um, and this picture kind of tries to show that shows that you know, for about 100 years, the, the poles and wires, the network that we look after, um, just did one thing, which was what it was built for, which was supplying bulk energy down to customers. And then with the advent of solar, um, it's now taken on this second role where it's now connecting a very large portion of the state's generation. And as we move forward, we get, we see more use of batteries and virtual power plants providing uh, frequency support services up into the market. Um, so helping the market to integrate larger scale renewables as well. And then of course, as we go beyond perhaps 2025 onwards, we see this transition to electric vehicles where the distribution network becomes the primary fuel network for, for transport in South Australia. So, so many new sources of value that um, we can derive from the same assets. And as we've said, it's kind of been the theme of the, of the presentation this evening, if we do our job properly as a distribution network operator um, and we can work with industry to actively integrate distributed energy resources with the grid so they're smart they understand the capacity of the grid and we can make the best use of the capacity that we've got um, then we can maximize that value while minimizing the need to spend more money on the network and the key to that is what we've talked about tonight so smart solar and smart flexible loads so yeah as i say if we do our job correctly then we can play our part in helping to accelerate the transition to a more resilient uh, low carbon and a lower cost energy system for south australia so on that note i'll uh, i'll stop there and we can go to questions well thank you Bryn. that was a uh, comprehensive and um covered uh, so much so much ground. Uh, thank you for that. Are you happy to read out the questions yourself or shall I read them out? Uh, the advantage of you doing it is uh, that people might understand. Um, otherwise I can take them one by uh, one. By one. Um, look, I haven't had a chance to look at them as I've been ah. presenting, so perhaps it would be helpful to me if you could uh, triage them a little bit. Yes, I'll take them from the top. Please outline uh, 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 SA Power Network's plans for replacement or upgrading of the uh, country sewer network, which um, accounts for 30% of yep. consumers. Yes, thanks. So I, I can see the questions here. Okay. So perhaps if you could just help me to prioritise them. So I think the short answer to that is we might perhaps the best thing to do is take that offline. Um, I would direct you to our, our recent regulatory proposal and what we call our distribution annual planning report that sets out um, our, what we're investing. We, there is an awful lot of SWER out there. Um, we can only spend money on the network that the regulator approves us to spend. And so um, we, yeah, if we were to undertake a wholesale upgrade of the SWIR network and replace SWIR with other things, for example, that would have a significant 
uh, upward impact on electricity prices. So that's that's not something the regulator um, will allow us to do. So we have to uh, we have to be prudent and efficient in the way that we allocate resources to upgrade the network. Right. Thank you. Uh, next question is about uh, blackout protection, installing uh, batteries for blackout protection, and your your thoughts about. It. Yeah, I think I think I think that's a that's a choice for the individual. Um, it depends on the product you buy as to whether that capability is available. Um, I I personally have got a battery at home, and that is something that I have um, in in my battery. Uh, perhaps partly because I live in the hills, so my network reliability is not as good as some places. Um, so I think it's an individual choice. Um, could your battery power the whole of uh, the whole of the house or just essential circuits? No, generally, generally batteries only power essential circuits. That's normally the way they're installed. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, it's a bit of a lottery as well. If you, if you're, if you're actively cycling your battery, um, which you, which you will be to, to store and then discharge your solar, then um, if a blackout occurs, um, obviously um, the benefit you get depends on how much energy you happen to have in the battery at the time. So uh, we have actually looked into, when we did a trial a couple of years ago with a virtual power plant where we looked into providing a service where we could um, essentially uh, send a signal to, to suggest that batteries pre-charge um, if we knew that there was an extreme weather event coming. So if there's a big storm coming and we think there's a risk that there's going to be some damage to our infrastructure, then we can flag that out to, to people's batteries and they can take the decision if they want to pre-charge themselves just in case the customer has an outage. Uh-huh. Yes, and blackouts are um, becoming more and more rare. Um, they, they're not eliminated, but um, and in the 40 years we've lived in Adelaide, they're uh, much much less frequent. Question on generating hydrogen for managing oversupply or generating hydrogen or processing any any materials. Any, uh, I suppose, have has SAPN looked at how to absorb surplus uh, surplus supply? Yep. Um, so again, it's not something that we would do as a network because um, we don't really have a a regulated role to do that. Um, but it's the, the use of surplus renewables to generate hydrogen is a key plank of the state government's long-term plans. They've got a hydrogen action plan. And so we're definitely looking at what impact that might have on our network. Generally, we expect hydrogen production plants to be big things connected probably at the high level of the network, potentially connected to Electronet's transmission network. Um, but it's definitely something we're interested in. So if we start to see a lot of interest in smaller hydrogen generation plants that would connect to our network, then we'll definitely do what we can to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, now there's a couple of questions about EVs. One is uh, how will EV impact modeling? Um, oh, sorry, yes. How will uh, electric vehicle supplies impact your modeling and uh, that is more batteries fed by solar. But uh, there's another question about uh, vehicle to grid. How that is well how we've considered that and uh, what likely ramifications are yep so there are so there are some trials that are running at the moment so arena the renewable energy agency is, is funding some trials right now um, that will be looking at vehicle to grid so we are we're not actively involved in those trials but we are we do sit on reference panels for them so we're definitely um, interested to see how those proceed. Um, it's a bit difficult to predict how vehicle to grid will go and how prevalent it will it will be. So so I think we're really looking to those those trials in the short term to, to give us some more insights into that. Um, certainly something that again the SA government um, has recently in its in its action plan or along with its action plan has, has made available 3.6 million I think dollars um, in funding for for smart electric vehicle charging trials in South Australia, and that includes um, vehicle to grid. So expect to see some trials in that area in SA um, in the next, next 12, 18 months. Right, thank you. Uh, question on uh, substations. How are you going to ensure that substations with negative flow are not stripped um, by under frequency? Yeah, it's, 
it's pretty simple. It's it's just a matter of disarming the the relays that are that are armed. So so the substation relays are, are armed to trip if the frequency starts to drop too rapidly. Um, we just need to to add an extra feature if you like, so that those relays actually understand what direction the current is flowing through them at the time, which they currently don't. So so if they understand that they are actually a net generator at the time, then they will they will not be armed to trip off in that circumstance. Uh -huh. Right, thank you. Now another question which might be more related to uh, transmission, but is South Australia considering demand management by large commercial or industrial customers with the uh, incentive of load reductions uh, as happens uh, apparently in smelters in the Netherlands? Um, yeah, I think I think the short answer is is yes. It's not a South Australian thing. Certainly, the the, the overall energy market, the Australian energy market, is is doing a lot of work at the moment to to examine any changes that need to be made to the markets or the rules to um, enable large loads to participate more actively, like that. So there's a lot of work happening in that space. Yes. So I guess there's a lot of grey areas with, which overlap between transmission and uh, distribution and um, uh, that you, you do work with Electronet in, in looking for opportunities for um, uh, demand and supply management. We do. Yep. Uh, what are you planning for smart electric vehicle chargers to move the demand away from the uh, peak evenings yeah as i say i think there's a lot of scope for that and we'll see a bunch of trials in that area um funded by the sa government over the next 12 to 18 months so i think i think we'll get a lot of learnings about the best way that might work um, from our perspective as a distribution network uh, we're definitely very interested in having some more sophisticated kinds of tariffs in future. So at the moment, for example, we've, we have um, hot water on controlled load, which is in South Australia, generally just on a time switch overnight. So the deal there is there's a lower network tariff because that circuit is only switched on for a certain number of hours overnight. So we know that that demand is not driving up network costs because it's not happening in peak times. I think in future, you can imagine a much more sophisticated version of that, where instead of just having a simple time switch, you have smart devices like electric vehicle chargers that can receive a very dynamic signal to tell them when's the, when's the lowest cost time to charge. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. We were definitely actively investigating those sorts of opportunities. Right, thank you. Uh, compliment here, great presentation, Bryn. A big reason South Australia is transitioning so well is because of SAPN's leadership. That's, that's, that's a kind statement, I think. I think we are, we find ourselves as leaders because South Australia is, is right at the forefront. So, so in some sense, we kind of have little choice but to lead, but, but I think as, as South Australians, it is, it is good for the state that we, we have that opportunity. So yes, I think a lot of the things that we're doing are, are setting the direction for industry in many ways. So, mm. which is, which is both a bit scary and also quite uh, exciting. Well, for avid readers of Renew Economies websites, I think they would have half the articles to go on if it uh, wasn't for South Australia. Um, but it's always great to read reports from interstate and overseas. Um, just to Google South Australia Renewable Energy and it, um, it certainly gives you a, a boost. Question on home batteries, apart from benefiting the customer, do they provide much benefit for the network? Yeah, so, so most of the benefit, certainly at the moment, most of the benefit that customers can get from their batteries um, doesn't, doesn't come from the network, it comes from the, the wholesale market. So, so if you look at where batteries are delivering the most benefit today through virtual power plants, um, it's in providing frequency support services, so FCAS. Um, wholesale price arbitrage as well. So just being able to respond to, to change in wholesale price. So that's, that's most of the benefit outside of just the customer's own self-consumption. Now, certainly as a network, we have um, 
constraints in our network where we might have to upgrade a substation because we're running out of capacity, for example. Um, in those circumstances, we can look to um, to engage people with batteries either through either directly or through virtual power plant operators to see if they can provide some peak shaving service for us, which we can then pay them for. Um, we don't have a, a whole lot of those sorts of constraints in our network at the moment. So, so just, just right now, there's not a lot of that kind of opportunity. Um, as we go forward, as we have new loads coming on electric vehicles and so on, there'll probably be more opportunities there. So, so right now, the main benefit that customers who are in virtual power plants are getting from their batteries comes from trading in the, the, the high level energy market. Uh -huh. right. Thank you. Ah, a question on synchronous condensers. Uh, what role do you see synchronous condensers having for short term grid stability? Perhaps you could just briefly explain what uh, synchronous condensers are. Yeah, well, I'll try, but um, this is where I confess I'm not actually an electrical engineer, but this is a, this is more of an Electronet thing than an SA Power Networks thing. So a synchronous condenser is a big spinning thing that um, it, so that the, well, it helps with what we call system strength. So it, it essentially is a device that can help to replace some of the capability that we've lost out of the system by the fact that we no longer have watering great spinning generators. Um, running all, all the time and they, those big spinning generators provide what we call system strength and, and frequency stability and so again it's not really SA Power Network's domain this is the domain of the higher level market operator AEMO that has to keep these things in balance um, and so synchronous condens condensers are devices that are being are being installed or have been installed on Electronet's network to provide some of this um, system strength in the absence of being able to run big spinning generators. That probably wasn't a great explanation, but uh, you might need to Google that one. Well, from my time working in the uh, snowy hydro, um, synchronous condensers were spinning, operating a generating motor mode for power fact factor correction, but they also acted as spinning reserve, which would cope with um, quick spikes. So I think now we are looking for batteries and uh, Spin heavy spinning uh, gen um, motor generators to cope with uh, with fast spikes. Uh, now, a question on community batteries: Do they have a role? Hosgrid's trialing in New South Wales and City Power in Victoria. Yep. So, yep. it's definitely a lot of interest in community batteries, and as you say. Um, Osgrid is doing some trials. The Western Australian networks as well have had a lot of focus on community batteries. There's some good trials happening in WA. Um, we, yeah, I think the short answer is we're supportive of community batteries. So um, we're definitely seeing increasing number, numbers of applications for people who want to connect grid scale batteries to our network. Um, I think the majority of them would be um, perhaps what you might think of as a more commercial proposition. Um, than uh, what you might think of as a community battery. Um, but there's definitely a lot of interest in South Australia in this, this concept of community batteries as well. So, so, so we're supportive. I mean, again, it's not, it's not something we have immediate plans to try to lead a trial in ourselves in South Australia. And that's really because we just don't have the resources to do that. We have, um, we have so many other pressing demands on our limited resources and we're, we're very aware that there's some really good trials happening interstate. So we're looking to, to learn as much as we can from those. Um, but certainly if someone, um, if there's interest in, in connecting community batteries to our network, we're definitely supportive of that. Yep, thank you. Why would the capacity of, uh, to take export energy not match the network capability to deliver energy? So if house wiring is installed for 20 to 30 kilowatts, why can't uh, we export at this level? presumably because of uh, the rest of the distribution network. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll give a superficial answer because I'm not really an electrical engineer, but it, 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 it just isn't symmetrical in that sense for a number of reasons. So, so the way that the, the voltage regulation is set up in the network, um, the way that substation transformers work, the way that the network architecture is, um, the way that things aggregate together as we move up into the network. So the, 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 there are a number of factors that limit how much energy we can we can take in the opposite direction um, that just mean that it's not symmetrical it's not 
it's not zero of course if we if we add more capacity to supply load that that will tend to increase the capacity to take energy in the uh, in the other direction as well but it's not it's not a one to one ratio mm -hmm. All right thank you now a question on the battery dump points i don't know if that's um the title you understand but it's why haven't they been created in the in new suburbs for dumping excess solar Yeah, I'm not sure what that refers to actually. Perhaps, mm -hmm. um, perhaps that's a community battery. Um, yeah, and that's the, that's the question I can elaborate on that one. I'm not quite sure what that, that refers mm -hmm. to. Okay, well, those were the, the questions, I think. Uh, on the chat line, do you determine or evaluate the effects of uh, EROI on your decision making? Does your distributed network build out increase EROI? And uh, perhaps if you could just explain the uh, the acronym. Uh, I assume it refers to return on investment. I'm not sure what the E is, but um... or oh, energy, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so mm -hmm. again, uh, yeah, unless the person can come off mute and um, and elaborate on that, I'm not sure if they mean if they mean does does investment in the network increase the value to the end customer? Then that is something that we've definitely looked at. That's we talked quite a lot about that in our last regulatory proposal when we were making the the um, making the investment case for the thirty odd million dollars of investment in in the systems that I talked about to enable smart inverters and flexible exports so we looked at um, how that capability um, creates increased value across the rest of the system so i'm not sure if that really answers the question but happy to talk more about that if, um, if you can be a bit more specific well i i can't and i think in the the time available um would uh, a little bit more notice would have been been handy there but those are all the the questions I um, did have a just a very quick question before renewables. Um, we, we hear that renewables have destabilised the grid. Well, there was a time that uh, we had load variations. Well, there's always been a time when we had load variations and we had to um, um, cope with them or, or correct them. Could you briefly say how? Things like that were um, have been done over the, the years long before renewables came in with their uh, intermittency, which has necessitated some of this work. Yeah, I, mean, I think again, at, perhaps I won't talk at the distribution network level. If you look at the system level, so the sorts of challenges that that AMO talks about in keeping the system stable in South Australia at times when we've got very, very high amounts of solar. It's it's a combination of two things. So so it's not just the intermittency of the generation, but it's also the, the, the loss of inertia from the system. So again, in times gone by, um, we had lots of large spinning generation plant, which has physical inertia. This is what keeps the frequency stable. It's just honking great physical spinning mm. machines that that if there's a if there's a sudden imbalance of supply and demand, they just take, they soak up a certain amount of that um, because they just, they have a, they have physical inertia. They, they don't speed up and slow down instantly. Um, things that are connected through inverters. So solar, solar PV, batteries and wind farms don't have that. They don't have that quality about them. So, so the system is, is less, much less stable in response to differences between supply and demand than it used to be. Ah, and the um, tolerances of supply voltage tolerances haven't um, tightened up because you're able to um, control them anymore. They're pretty well the same as they've, they've always been, but um, the, there's more variation in, in supply. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you 
very much for that. You've um, handled all the, explained all the, the questions well. Oh, one quick comment. The Network Innovation Centre, is that open for um, organised groups to, to visit? Or has that gone, uh, been affected by the, uh, uh, by the virus? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one offline. I think we are running tours again of the Network Innovation Centre. Um, I suspect the numbers are probably restricted. Um, but yes, I think, I think we are now doing tours again um, for, for small groups. So as you know, it's not, it's not open to the public, but it's, um, yeah, absolutely somewhere that we can, we can bring in industry people to, to have a look at what we're doing. Are you? Well, thank you. Thank you again very much. And um, sorry about what happened back in November where we had to cancel that same day um, uh, with the, the virus, which turned out to be a, a bit of a fizzer. So would you be okay to stay online for a couple of minutes with, um, with David? And um, otherwise I'll bid everyone good night and see you at the next renew meeting either in the flesh or um or online in february march april may so to all the attendees thank you for your attendance and good night